So the organizer, shall we start or do we have to wait? The organizers, please let me know. Mbak Ucha, should we start? Or I don't see Bu Rina, one of the judges here. Yet. Uh, sorry, welcome everyone to the um, for our presentation sessions. I believe we are in the room one uh, for oral presentations with uh, uh, pre oral presenters here. And now I'm waiting for confirmations. Oh, right. Okay. So now we have. Uh, a go um, good to go um, sign from the organizers to start. So um, part of the oral presentation, we have the uh, the uh, judges to um, to assess the presentations or the general rules are have um, seven minute presentation for um, the. Uh, the judges we have here, uh, of course, myself and also Mbak uh, Krista Dewi. Uh, here, Mbak Krista, hi, Mbak Krista. So, you yeah. so, uh, um, I, I think Burina will uh join a bit later, but uh, it will the session will be recorded, so uh, she will be uh, having chance also to assess. So, without further ado, be, uh, ado because we have uh. We are strict in time. Um, the first presentation is we have six presenters. I I would like to check if everyone everyone is here. Mas Pak Firdaus Hafiz, I can see you. And uh, Atul Kenje, um, sorry for my pronunciation. And Yoma Christiani uh, Tarukbua. Are you here? Um, oh, ada. And Ibu Astri Ferdiana. She's not here yet, but it's fine. Hi. Sorry. Oh, Dr. Henry Louis. You look familiar. Yeah. Oh, yes. Pak Fahrin. Uh, no, I, I will be presenting for Dr. Astri. 
on behalf of Bu Astri Firadiana. Okay, yes. good. Okay, and Bu Umi Latifah, you're here. Okay. Yeah, everyone is here, so we are. Uh, we we will start then. So Pak Firdaus with uh, the title "Get Diagnosed Before and After COVID-19 Pandemic: The Catastrophic of the RTB Patient Cost in Indonesia." Uh, are you ready? Seven seven minutes is yours. Please go ahead. Hi, um, can my voice can we hear clearly? Yes. Okay. Um, is it okay if I? Um, okay. Let me. Wait, wait a minute. Uh, since I'm in Papua, is it okay to share my uh, pre-recorded video? I'm I'm afraid uh, the internet connection might not be right. Is it okay? I hope it's fine. Hi, I'm Habits. It is an honor to present get diagnosed before and after COVID-19 pandemic, the catastrophic of drug-resistant tuberculosis patient costs in Indonesia. So the COVID-19 pandemic is a public health disaster that happened in a swift manner which might cause the collapse of health systems. COVID-19 and tuberculosis have a great potential to worsen the financial state of in the individuals and household. Drug-resistant tuberculosis is a major contributor to antimicrobial resistance worldwide and continues to be a public health threat. Annually, about 28,000 patients in Indonesia fell ill with a drug-resistant tuberculosis. People with drug-resistant tuberculosis face significant economic and social costs. Therefore, assessing the financial catastrophic costs of drug-resistant tuberculosis is vital to improve the access and outcome of tuberculosis. This study aimed to estimate the proportion of the catastrophic cost experienced by drug-resistant tuberculosis patients before and after COVID-19 pandemic in Indonesia. We are using a cross-sectional survey with retrospective data collection and projection was conducting using certified cluster random sample of Indonesia in national representative. There were 178 drug-resistant tuberculosis patients across 25 districts in Indonesia were interviewed. Patients who were on treatment for the last two weeks during in their intensive or continuation phase were recruited. In this survey, data were collected from the tuberculosis treatment card and from the patients, including direct costs, income loss, time loss, non-medical costs, such as food transport and food supplement, and income and coping strategies. We analyze catastrophic costs, which is when the TB related cost is more than 20% of household income. We use the logistic regression to analyze the data. The social demographic is the characteristic of the patients. At the total of 178 DRTB patients, drug resistant tuberculosis patients, approximately 65% were men. Most of the patients were at their productive age, 79% age 15 to 54 years old. Approximately 80% of all patients had an education in secondary school or above. And more than 90% of all drug-resistant tuberculosis patients reported having insurance scheme. The proportion of patients with insurance was slightly higher among patients who were diagnosed before March 2020. The clinical characteristic regarding the treatment phase, 75% of patients were in the continuation phase. HIV test result reported that 13% of drug resistant and tuberculosis patients had not performed HIV tests. There were still 14% of drug resistant and tuberculosis patients not having treatment observer. The average total household cost using the output approach by estimating the direct 
cost and income loss was 515 US dollar or 7.5 million rupiah. Meanwhile, the total cost component for direct medical costs, direct non medical costs, and income loss was more than double in diagnosis after March 2020 compared to diagnosis before March 2020. The highest component for diagnosis for March 2020 was income loss, which is 235 US dollar or 3 million, while diagnosis after March 2020 were direct non medical costs around 1,100 US dollar or 17 million. The direct non medical costs was predominantly allocated for nutritional supplement, the coping mechanism. There were several ways for TB patients to cope with the TB related expenditures, like cashing out their savings, taking loans, and selling their assets. Most of the patients had a combination of coping strategies. More than double of patient diagnosed after March 2020 need to take a combination of strategies to cope with the TB expenditure compared to those who diagnosed before March 2020. Using the current definition of catastrophic, which I say that when the TB related to cost is more than 20% of household income, the prevalence of catastrophic costs before and after March 2020 was more than 80%. Looking at the risk factor, unifariate and multivariate analysis identified four risk factors for TB catastrophic costs. They were diagnosed after March 2020 with low economic status, having treatment observers, and being hospitalized. And this is the continuous table. So we conclude that COVID-19 pandemic is a huge challenge to eliminating the catastrophic cost of TB patient in Asia. Substantial improvement of social protection is vital to protect patients with strong engagement of stakeholders in addressing the COVID-19 situations. The study will be the basis for further policy improvement to tackle the catastrophic costs faced by resistant tuberculosis patients. Action should be taken together with all sectors and the community to achieve zero TB effective household facing this catastrophic cost. We're grateful to the Ministry of Health, World Health Organization for their support to conduct this tuberculosis patient cost survey in Indonesia, and also Center for Tropical Medicine, Universitas Gajah Mada, Universitas Eswanga, Universitas Diponegoro, and Universitas 11 Maret during the data collection and analysis. Finally, let us together to achieve TB elimination in Indonesia. Thank you for your attention. Happy to discuss further with you all. Yes, thank you, Pak Firdaus. And for the presentations, it's um, short and efficient. So we, we do still have time for the questions. Um, Mbak Krista, do you have any comment or questions for Pak Firdaus? I do have one, but please go ahead if you do. You can go ahead, Mas Adi. Okay. And uh, Firdaus, if I'm not mistaken, one of the factors that associated with the catastrophic cost is the treatment of observers, right? In your analysis, can you please elaborate more about that? Yeah. Uh, what it you. means and then how it is. Yeah. Please. Thank you so much. It's uh. It's grateful to present this and uh, for the questions. Um, so it means that diagnosis after March 2020, it shows higher of catastrophic costs, means uh, there's a more expenditures or it less income in that situations that having more, more uh, risk to be a catastrophic. And of course, we it's not... Um, it's, 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 it is expected to have a low economic status to be uh, one of the risk factor of the catastrophic itself um, and being hospitalized since hospitalization is very uh, high cost, especially for the non-medical costs to access the services, even though the medical cost has been covered by the donors or any insurance. But the one that is uh, still questionable is the having treatment observers, which means that the more you are observed, <laughs> the more you're getting more catastrophic. Yeah. I'm not quite sure. Maybe this is uh, like uh, the one that because they are adverse to the treatment, so they need to keep accessing the health services uh, daily basis, as we know, therefore, the DRTB. So it costs more for them. I think that's the 
the elaboration of the <laughs> explanations. I hope it's clear. Yeah, interesting. So second chance for you, well, Krista, comment or question? Otherwise yeah. we can go to, okay. yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Like uh, in the study, like it is also mentioned that about the non-medical cost, maybe can you explain more about what is actually the non-medical cost, which is uh, very high, like in this study that you said. Thank you, Makisa, for the questions. Uh, for the non-medical costs, uh, it include the travel, accommodations, food, and nutrition supplements. And it's interesting that uh, Indonesian people for, uh, for the DRTB, they are really focusing on the nutrition supplement. I think there are some kind of... Uh, you know, and a motivation to having more uh, better nutrition to get uh, uh, better from their disease. And also the second one that's most of the cost was the travel. I think this is um, as expected also because they need to travel to the health facilities in daily basis uh, to get access to the medicine. I think this is uh, part of the thing that uh, the Minister of Health or Social Affairs need to uh, take care of to make sure that it's covered or at least they are, um, you know, don't get catastrophic because of this access to health services. Over. Okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you, uh, Krista and my speakers for the um, answers. Then I think I have to wrap up for uh, my speakers sessions, and then I would like to go to the second uh, presenter for these sessions, Atul uh, Shenge. Uh, I'm not sure if I pronounce it correctly, but uh, my apologies if I don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, the presentation is Implementation Challenges in the Direct Benefit Transfer Scheme for Nutritional Support of Tuberculosis Patients in India. So, Mr. Yes. Atul, uh, the seven minutes is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello and good day, everyone. My name is Atul Chendge. I am a master's in public health student at General School of Public Health and Human Development in the OP General Uni Global University, India. The topic of my presentation is implementation challenges in direct benefit transfer scheme for nutritional support of tuberculosis patient in India. So we all know that tuberculosis disproportionately affects poor sections of the society, and there is a direct relationship of tuberculosis and nutrition. The risk of development of tuberculosis uh, disease increases with malnutrition. There is adequate evidence suggesting the importance of uh, adequate nutrition for successful treatment. And the other aspect is the disease's socioeconomic effect that shows the causal link between poverty and malnutrition. And India contributes to almost one fourth of the global burden of tuberculosis. So uh, further, we've also seen that, you know, there is a national under the national health program, the government of India has set the target of eliminating tuberculosis by 2025, which is five years earlier than the sustainable developmental goal of uh, 2030. So uh, there is a national strategic plan of 2027 to 2025 to end TB by 2025, and it is being implemented across the country. The National Tuberculosis Elimination Program basically provides direct benefit uh, transfer to the nutritional, for the nutritional support to the patients of tuberculosis under the Niksha Potion Yojana. The Government of India's Direct Benefit Transfer Scheme serves as an example of the revolutionary solution that has been developed under the NSP to solve the long-standing obstacle of tuberculosis management in India. So this work provides an uh, policy analysis and implementation challenges of the nutritional scheme in India. So the method used was a desk review of existing uh, policy documents and national guidelines to review the existing DBT scheme under the NTEP. And there was a literature review which was conducted to synthesize the implementation challenges of the DBT scheme under the NTEP across the country. And the findings were triangulated with the information provided by the field implementers. Through uh, our uh, research work, we found out that there are four uh, schemes under the uh, NTEP 
uh, which give direct benefit transfer. Uh, the, each scheme has a specific beneficiary. They all have specific uh, objectives and uh, they give benefits or incentives based on the um, objectives that they are placed. So the first is the Nikshi Potion Yojana, which is for all tuberculosis patients to provide nutritional support. They are given a uh, thousand rupees, approximately 12 US dollars uh, as an advance. And then they continue uh, giving, getting 500 rupees, which is approximately six US dollars uh, till their treatment is over. There is another transport support uh, for TB patients in the tribal areas, which uh, give, uh, provides them with uh, finances for transportation and travel. And it is an additional support given uh, of rupees 750 rupees, approximately nine US dollars, and it is a one time payment. Then the remaining two schemes are an incentives. The first one is for uh, private providers and for um, who notify TB patients, and uh, they get a 500 rupees for notification. And the second amount that they get is for updating the outcome. The fourth uh, is an honorarium, which is given to community support treatment, uh, some community treatment supporters like NGOs and CBOs. And uh, the price ranges from 1000 rupees, that is approximately 12 US dollars to 3000 rupees, that is approximately 37 US dollars based on the updation of the patient's outcome, treatment outcome. So the challenges that we found out uh, were basically implementation challenges. We found out that 2.13 million TB infected individuals were notified to be eligible for the DBT scheme, uh, up according to two, uh, 2021. And out of that, only 62.1% of these beneficiaries were provided at least one DBT. The major implementation challenges were further identified and categorized into two parts. The first part was program related challenges, which included the uh, lack of training of the staff. And then there was uh, these forms were very, very complicated to fill and update. There was lack of documentation and residents proof to avail DBT schemes as most of the lower income population in India are migrating population or rural population who also find it difficult to have access to these documents, which will give them these services. We also found out that there was a failure in authentication of, uh, to register because one of the primary requirement is that you need to register your, uh, your national identity card that is Aadhaar card to the bank. So when you go for authentication because of the laborious work that you may be in uh, or the other uh, health issues that you may have, there is a difficulty with giving your thumb imprints and uh, eye, uh, eye authentication. There was delay in transfer of funds, and these delays were basically uh, basically uh, hindering the entire concept of benefit of uh, nutritional support. And there was inadequate linkage for, from the private sectors, because most of the people who don't find it easy or quick uh, process in government uh, setups, they go to private setups. Then the results we found out from the beneficiary uh, related challenges is that challenges with utilization due to high technical requirements, most of a population who are in the rural India or migrating population or labor work population, they, uh, the they are not very technologically developed. So it becomes very difficult for them, uh, uh, sorry, technologically advanced. So they, it becomes difficult for them to, you know, comprehend what the document is talking about, how to fill their forms and so on and so forth. There was limited availability and access to services in difficult terrains because uh, if you see one of the aspect was tribal population, which are in the uh, interior parts of the states, which become uh, so you need to change a couple of uh, modes of transport to go to a center because there is one center for suppose for three or four districts, so it becomes very difficult for them to uh, trans. Uh, go for the services. There was lack of awareness about the DBT scheme among the beneficiaries and the patients themselves were reluctant to give the personal information because of the fear of being outed. The last that we found out was there was internalized stigma to share the document of DBT for DBT registration and opening of bank account. Because what happens is these people who could be in um, labor work or uh, female sex workers, their daily wage is very, very important for them. So if somebody comes to know about that tuberculosis patient, uh, their status, they may not get that day's money. And so it becomes very difficult for them to tell their, uh, you know, to communicate with anybody out of the fear that what if someone else comes to know. So what we've discussed and concluded is that the lengthy uh, reporting formats and lack of supporting documents for registration was a major threat to uptake of the DBT scheme. 
we need adequate training of the staff to increase coverage of services for the unmet needs and there needs to be an intensive iic campaigns to reach out to the missed beneficiary we also uh, would like to put forth that the linkage of dbd disbursement mechanism with the provision of i non it based mechanisms needs to be there through local administration because of the population who are in the tribal areas and the hard to reach population can avail these services very easily we need to strengthen mechanism to track loss of uh, loss to follow beneficiaries and we need to ensure integration with the dbt schemes with food security schemes because these dbt schemes is primarily for the patient but if they are given 750 rupees for travel allowance but i i have a family who is hungry since past couple of days i will use that money to pay or feed my family and not for my travel allowance so we need to merge with the food security schemes as well so that each scheme give, fulfill its basic criteria we need to develop functional and realistic mechanism for grievance redressal and we need increased engagement of private sectors in bridging the technical gaps to seek dbt benefits thank you so much i am open to questioning thank you mr atul um yeah uh, i have one questions um this is a very interesting uh, topic of course uh, you analyze you analyze you analyze for Uh, type scheme of dbt uh, yes and yes. and i understand according to your your uh, findings and recommendations they are not perfect but i'm just wondering of all these four schemes which one do you think is uh, the closest to ideal or do you think there is a need for uh, an uh, such an ideal scheme that based on that that need to be built on uh, the lesson learned that you highlighted I think the first one was comparatively better the nikshe portion yojana was comparatively better for the population who were in urban places and it was easy for them to access these services but uh, if you compare like you know there is urban and then there is rural so uh, the same scheme was not working in the rural place however the remaining three schemes were any which was not working in the rural space so comparatively at least there is one aspect of nikshe portion yojana that was working in the urban area Thank you for the awesome. information. Appreciate it. Uh, I don't see Ibu Rina's joining. So, Mbak Krista. Oh, okay. Yeah. Your Thank you. Comment, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'm interested because, like, uh, in the in the abstract that I read in the presentation, you want to see about the DPT scheme, but uh, specifically to the nutritional support. Yes. Yeah, but like uh, when you presented, there is another uh, scheme, not only the nutritional support, but also travel. And then the nutritional support, can you elaborate more, which is it is uh, like uh, in the form of the um, fund money to transfer to the patient and how like uh, this scheme ensure that the money it will be used like for the, you know, like buying food or something like that. I mean, like, is there any like, uh, what is it? How to evaluate later on, like, for the use of the scheme for the nutritional support for uh, specialty? Sure, ma'am. So actually, uh, that is the your question actually answers the biggest question that why was this uh, scheme a failure? Because uh, this is a nutritional scheme primarily. But because, uh, in uh, if as mentioned during the presentation, the population is not a, a rich population or a middle class population. These in, these are lower income families. So these families, when you talk about them, these are migrant workers who are daily wage workers, and the money they get around what around one dollar or maybe two dollars per day. Okay, if you convert it to Indian rupees, it will be two hundred rupees maximum. so that is their daily earning so when you talk about nutritional support giving it as a finance actually will divert the whole idea of nutritional support because their needs are something else and also what happens is that uh, when you are giving money as a nutritional support if suppose i am a daily wage worker i am doing a laborious work during day i may go and drink alcohol in the night with the same money which i collected for my nutritional support so when i talk about food security support, uh, schemes is where we have this pds system public distribution system where they give rations where they give monthly rationing uh, of food like rice wheat etc so if we could bring 
that aspect into the scheme where we give ration instead of money it would be more beneficial and then we can say it is actually a nutritional support scheme because giving money actually we have seen we did see that most of the labor worker they collected the money and be, they would drink or they would smoke and they would spend it for something else so that was the major major challenge and that's why the recommendation is that we don't give complete money yes we give them money for travel travel allowances but along with that we give them food directly instead of money so that will actually also help them to have balance the nutrition intake and also in some way support their families as well thank you yeah. mr Arthur. thank you thank you, thank you so much so yeah unfortunately we have to move to the next uh, presenters and um, again thank you for your time uh, mr atul and the presentations now the the third uh, presenter is um I, I think i believe it's ibuyoma christiani tarukbua investigation contacts for detection of latent tb cases and provision of tpt and active tb among contacts in mimika district papua 2020-2022 ibu yoma are you here yes yes yeah thank you yeah your seven seven minutes is starting please go ahead Ibu Yoma. Ibu Yoma, can you start? Oh, yes, I have. Uh, little problem. Sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, then to save time, to I, I, I hope you don't mind that we. Uh, I, I would. I need to check if the next presenter uh, is ready. Was it pa Fahrin? On behalf of Ibu Astri Fadiana, then you can go first, and then. Yes. Um, okay. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, pa about spinal tuberculosis in Indonesia. A five year epidemiology and risk factor. So, your seven minutes, Pavarin, and after this, we can come back to uh, Ibu Yong. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, and I can okay. hear you too. Yeah, please go ahead. So, okay, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the opportunity. My name is Pavarin Ramadanan Vijaya. I'm a physical medicine and rehabilitation resident at the uh, Faktos Kedokteran Universitas Erlangga and RSUD Dr. Sutomo. I'm part of the research team of the spinal tuberculosis in Indonesia. And today I will present you our preliminary findings uh, from the uh, RS uh, Professor Dr. Raden Suharso at, uh, in Solo. So <clears throat> tuberculosis or TB, uh, it's still a significant public health issue in Indonesia. And three years ago, in 2019, TB was the third leading cause of death and the fourth highest contributor to disability-adjusted life in Indonesia. And outside the lung parenchyme, TB, uh, TB's manifestation is called the extrapulmonary TB. And this includes the tuberculosis of the musculoskeletal system. And spinal tuberculosis, or spinal TB, or otherwise known as spondylitis TB, or POTS disease, is the most common manifestation of uh, TB in the musculoskeletal system. And it, and it accounts for about 50% of all cases, of all TB musculoskeletal cases, and approximately 1 until 2% of all TB cases. And for spinal TB, the consequences, uh, if untreated, uh, is uh, paraplegia or weakness in the lower limbs or even uh, quadriplegia 
and also uh, spinal uh, deformities. So it is important to identify the burden and also risk factors of this de debilitating condition. And is, this is important to formulate effective intervention uh, in the future. However, uh, currently uh, there are limited data available on the burden of spinal TB in Indonesia. Uh, therefore, the study aims to describe the epidemiology and characteristic of spinal TB patients in Indonesia. So uh, we conducted a retrospective review on medical records of confirmed spinal TB patients between uh, 2017 uh, to, to, until 2021, so for five years. Uh, uh, currently, we, we conducted uh, the review at the uh, RS Orthopedi uh, uh, Raden Suharso in, in Solo, Central Java, but we are currently conducting a multi-site uh, medical review, so in Jakarta, Jogjakarta, Solo, and also in Surabaya. So the criteria of spinal TB case uh, for our research is the, the TB, the spinal TB needs to be diagnosed clinically and also radiographically, and by the time of admission and also at, at, dis at discharge, uh, the medical record should note that the ICD-10 uh, is for uh, TB spondylitis or spinal TB. And the patient needs to be at least five years of age uh, and over. So for our variables, we have seven main variables. So this includes the demographics, the clinical manifestation, uh, neurological status, lab results, uh, radiographic findings, uh, treatment history, and also the outcome after admission to the hospital. Uh, so the data were extracted by our trained research assistants from the medical records straight to the online case record forms. Uh, we use global collect platform for this. And also we analyze descriptively uh, to, to see the frequency and the proportion uh, of the cases. And we use our studio for this. Um, so for our preliminary results, uh, we have 312 records uh, of confirmed spinal TB. Uh, this we account for missing data. So for this 312 records are, uh, are the ones with complete uh, data without, without any missing data. And for the age distribution, uh, the median age for the study is 49.5 years of age. And for the distribution, uh, the sex distribution, uh, for female patients, there were 54.1% of spinal TB patients in the Raden Suharso Hospital. And for the presenting uh, chief complaints uh, during admission to the hospital, most of the patient had uh, back pain. So about 70% of the patient had back pain, back pain. But if we combine uh, numbness, deformity, and pain or also weakness, uh, this accounts for almost 30% of the uh, patients. Uh, for coexisting co diseases or comorbidities, uh, most patients had a history of TB treatment, so previous TB infection uh, was uh, noted. Uh, also, interestingly, 45% of the patient had a uh, history of physical trauma or uh, fall or uh, accidents. And for the radiographic findings, uh, we found that 66% of our, the patients had um, pathological fracture uh, during the uh, spinal x-ray and also the CT scan. Uh, this correlates to the, to the um, physical trauma that we uh, found. And for the tuberculosis treatment, 90% of, of the patients received the category one of the anti-tuberculosis uh, treatment. So uh, for our conclusion and discussion, uh, our preliminary results showed uh, variations in the clinical characteristics of spinal TB cases. Uh, this is for the uh, Raden Suharso Hospital in Solo. And as I mentioned in uh, the results, uh, most patients uh, were found already in the latter stage where deformities has already appeared and also uh, weakness in the lower limbs and even uh, quadriplegia was also presented. So there needs to be a focus on preventing uh, this earlier uh, in the future. However, we need further analysis uh, to identify risk factors for spinal TB cases. Okay. Uh, 
thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Pak Fahrin, for the presentations. Um, I have uh, just a comment or slash questions. I think uh, based on the, the, the this epidemiological analysis and, yes. and your findings, do you have um, uh, any practical implications that you uh, recommend for uh, based on the results? Um, yes, uh, thank you very much for the comment and question. Yes, it is, uh, it is a tricky disease, if, if we might say, if we may say, uh, because uh, from the presenting chief illness or uh, chief complaint, uh, back pain or lower back pain is very common to other diseases too. So if we would like to screen it earlier, it might be, um, the, the, the sensitivity would be quite high, but it might not be specific to, uh, mm. to, um, to a spinal TB case. Uh, but uh, we are exploring, we, we are currently exploring qualitatively, and also we are conducting um, surveys to know uh, what might we do in the future for, for patients to understand their disease progression earlier, uh, whether it's by uh, using, um, for example, the Puskesmas to, to know more about uh, spinal TB um, mm -hmm. or might we use uh, radiographic screenings uh, when there's a, uh, um, a risk about uh, spinal TB, but uh, we are currently working on that. Uh, yeah. Hopefully, by the end of the year, we have <laughs> we have uh, a concrete answer <laughs> to your question. But uh, yes, uh, that, that that will be my answer for now. Thank you. Looking forward to the answer then. <laughs> yeah, Bakrista, please take it away if you have any questions. No, I have no question. I think it is good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank. You. Then uh, your your time is uh, wrapped. Uh, Fahrin, thank you very much again thank for the presentation much. and also the discussions. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, I would like to invite back Ibuyoma. Are you ready, Ibuyoma, uh, yes. with the presentation? Yes, I'm ready. Yes, please uh, do share your screen. And then, uh, yeah, your seven minutes is uh, starting. Okay, thank you for the time that you have given to me. Uh, I'd love to uh, present my uh, abstract investigation of contacts for detection of latent tuberculosis cases and provision of PPT and active TB among contacts in Mimica Regency, Papua, 2020 to 2022. Background. Tuberculosis is preventable and curable, yet it is the world's second deadliest infectious disease behind COVID-19. An estimated 1.8 billion people, of which 35% are from Southeast Asia, including Indonesia, are infected with Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Up to 10% of them will become ill with tuberculosis in their lifetime, enabling them to infect others. To eliminate TB, it is important to prevent the activation of latent tuberculosis infection. Investigation to contact of active TB patient is key strategy to identify individuals with latent tuberculosis. And the study will report on coverage of active tuberculosis case funding in an identification of latent tuberculosis cases and provision of TPT from contact investigation activity in Mimica District, Papua. Methods. Uh, this is a descriptive cross-sectional study to five 5,905 contacts of 1,897 tuberculosis patients from uh, 1 January 2020 to 26 October 2022 in Mimica District, Papua. And the data were collected from its health facility and the TB information system. Data were compiled and analyzed descriptively in an Excel file. Result. Between January 2020 to October 2022, there were 1,000, 
1,897 patients who underwent contact investigation or 37.7% of total tuberculosis patients in Nimica district. 43 or 2.2% were diagnosed as drug-sensitive tuberculosis patients and 3 or 0.1% as drug-resistant tuberculosis patients. Of 5,905 contacts, 5,819 or 98.5% were contacts of the STB patient and 68 or 1.4% were contacts of the RTB patient. Uh, this is the TPT from 2020 to 2022. Uh, in 2020, there were 91 contacts that who received TPT, but only 25 in 2021. Uh, but this is increased in 2022 uh, until 402. Um, this is the picture when uh, in 2022 that take uh, uh, CPT and uh, from uh, uh, to do TPT, uh, give TPT to the prisoner of uh, Mimica prison. Uh, TPT that uh, TPT regimen use uh, are 3 HP 327. Uh, 6H, 160, 3HR, uh, 11, uh, 6 levofloxacin, and levofloxacin and etambutol uh, is 10. Final outcome treatment, uh, complete treatment, uh, 318 or 57.9% failed one or 0.1% and lost to follow up 22 or 4%. Conclusion, implementation of DPT is increasing in Mimica District Papua and several regimen are available and the short TPT regimen using 3HP is the preferred regimen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ibu Yoma. Um, so I would like to invite Mbak Krista first for yeah. comment or any question. Yeah, please go. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, very interesting that uh, I, I know you yeah, like you present like the increasing of TPT because like the conduct investigation is done in the uh, correctional activity uh, facility. So like uh, that's why like it like it is increasing. So maybe you can also uh elaborate more actually what is the I mean in how about the contact investigation at the community level where it's like uh, the challenge or something like that because maybe like in the correctional facility maybe it is like uh, I assume it will be easier because they have to obey like you have to take this TPT and then yeah they can they can take it easily rather than in the community. Maybe you can elaborate more about the contact investigation at the community level and the TPT as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for comment. Mm. Yes, uh, so uh, uh, every, every health facility Every health facility uh, uh, give uh, the the government is also are also uh, include in here. So uh, investigation contact for uh, 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 TB officer in every health in every health facilities uh, doing their best. Uh, and their motivation is uh, when there is a, 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 a HTBS 
uh, and there's uh, uh, searching for uh, doing screening in every uh, facilities. So uh, uh, when when doing that, uh, uh, many of uh, there, there's so much of um, uh, finding finding new cases of uh, tuberculosis and also uh, also also uh, give uh, giving a. Uh, uh, education of of uh, health health of officer of health of uh, uh, of every health facilities. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ibu Yoma. Uh, I think I don't have questions. Um, just. Uh, Comment and I think it's related to what uh, the point that uh, Mbak Krista said, because I believe uh, Mimika is one of the district um, being intervened with the with the global fund support program. Is is that correct? Or I think uh, around two hundred and fifty. I believe if there are some lesson learned from this uh, investigation contact and uh, the type of. Uh, uh, cat finding that you you do i think uh, for the community level you, you can partner with uh, the the community officers i don't really I, I, i'm not really familiar with the design of uh, implementation arrangement for the tb program but i think it's something that you can explore to to see how it, at the community level the approach that you are doing also can be implemented to expand the coverage uh, for the cat finding yeah um Iburina is here, so so sebentar. Iburina, yes, Iburina. Yes. I, I, I'm not sure if you already you uh, had chance to um, observe the presentations, but if you do have no. questions, we still have time. No, unfortunately, not. Sorry, I'll join for the next presentation. Yeah, for sure. for the previous one, I uh, gave Rick uh, Mark from the recording yeah sorry yeah. <laughs> no problem ibu yeah okay then uh with that i would like uh, thank you ibu yoma for the presentation and also the discussions then i would like to move to uh the next presentation which is my uh which is a good friend of mine hi dr henry Lewis. <laughs> <Hello. laughs> nice to see you here <laughs> Uh, with uh, the presentation is aura fluid HIV subtesting amongst young key populations during COVID-19 pandemic in Badung, Bali. So, Mas Henry, seven minutes is yours. Please. Thank you. Is Thank my you. voice clearly heard? And yes. the slide is uh, synced? Okay. Yeah, but it's not in a slideshow okay. mode set. Yeah, if you could do that, then that would be good. Yes. Okay. Uh, Check this. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, uh, Masaji, for the time slot uh, to allow me to present our abstract entitled Oral Food HIV Testing Amongst Young Key Populations uh, During COVID 19 Pandemic in Badung, Bali. Uh, this is the outline of the presentation, which includes the brief background of uh, the project and the project descriptions and its results and concluded with some lesson learned from the project. Uh, we all know that the COVID-19 put a detrimental challenge to, the, to disrupt the HIV testing, especially amongst uh, certain uh, key populations, key, key affected populations such as the MSM, the TG, and the TWIT, uh, who face the existing barriers to HIV care, such as the stigma, misconceptions around the HIV and other social aspects of health. To end it by 2030, uh, to achieve the first HIV uh, target testing is crucial despite some challenges faced by healthcare facility and community due to the COVID-19. Additional strategy needs to be implemented uh, to get uh, the discrete and high risk individuals who never attended the facility-based testing. The Aura Quick Rapid uh, HIV antibody testing can be one of the alternative additional strategies to HIV testing or screening in the communities. 
It is safe and convenient and less invasive. It is effective and may be well accepted to certain uh, hard to reach communities. Uh, it empowers the user and it also address certain stigma uh, to a certain point. Uh, due to its novelty, it may generate demands toward the HIV testing itself. Okay, uh, this uh, sort project was conducted in Badung Regency, which is the second highest, uh, which is the second highest HIV burden in Bali province. Uh, a virtual and face-to-face -face approach were conducted to reach out to the discrete and hard to reach KP from November to December of 2021. The prospective candidates were then given the oral food uh, HIV testing. The clients were counseled and guided for the self-testing and positive clients were motivated to attend the nearest clinic for confirmatory HIV blood test. Uh, here's the flow charts of the project. The information were disseminated through social media, such as the Facebook, the Instagram, and other uh, dating application, as well as face-to-face uh, -face outreach to hotspot. Information distributed or disseminated includes the HIV, the basic HIV knowledge, the OFD itself, and the help or assistance needed for this OFD project. Uh, the client uh, were then directed to access the websites for eligibility assessment. Only key population were eligible to participate. Client then, uh, the clients can then choose uh, statement methods. There were three statement methods. The first is the client can choose the statement by courier, and then the OFT kits will be sent through an on-demand online platform such as Gojek and Grab. Uh, the test kit can also be self-picked up uh, by the clients at the outreach office. Or the third, the client can make appointment to pick up the test kit at any desired locations, including the hotspot. Once the OFD is received by the clients, the client can choose to conduct the, the test by themselves or to be assisted by the outreach worker. The result can then be reported to the website by uploading the picture of the used test kit. Client with non-reactive result will be educated for HIV positive prevention and reactive clients will be motivated to do the confirmatory HIV blood testing in the nearest, in the nearest HIV services. This is the outlook of the OFT booking website. Uh, during this project, uh, 743 clients were reached, 52.5% uh, by virtual outreach and 47.5% by physical outreach. The age of the distribution of the client reach is shown in the second bar chart. 13.5% uh, age below 24 years old. Uh, of all the of all the client reach, 94.95.4% is SMS, 1.6% CGs, and 3% are periods. Only uh, 696 clients were over OFT. Uh, 45 seven clients were dropped out from the project because they have access to HIV testing within the last three months. Only 95 clients, which is 13.5%, uh, were willing to finally participate in this OFT. And three clients were tested positive and motivated to attend a clinic for confirmatory HIV blood testing. Uh, from this short durations project, we can conclude some lessons. Uh, the oral fluid rapid antibody HIV self-testing is, a, is, a, is still a novel means of HIV testing for key populations. The low uptake may be due to the brief project periods, uh, yet it managed to, for us to get some of those who failed to attend uh, to a facility-based testing in challenging times. The implementation of this OFT requires some resources and adequate uh, preconditions such as the training, the cost, the distribution, the storage, and etc. Uh, no emergency or social harms were reported during the project. The OFD is expected to continue despite the COVID-19 pandemic end. And hopefully the OFD can be scaled up to help bridge the gap of HIV testing among key population in Indonesia. Uh, this project was part of the uh, 
Indonesia HIV Response Eliminating the H Epidemic in Indonesia by 2030 under the new funding model continue of HTB Malaria Program by the Global Fund 2021. Thank you and looking forward for comments and input. Thank you, uh, Mas Kandri. That's a very interesting uh, uh, project and also the analysis. I think um, uh, before I do have questions, but I would like to invite Ibu Rina first if uh, there is any comment or questions for uh, Mas Henry Luis, Ibu Rina. Yes, okay, thank you, Pak Ari. Uh, Pak, 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 with, with Henry, yeah. Dr. Henry, uh, congratulations. Yeah, I think this is a uh, very, uh, I'm not familiar with uh, HIV. I'm a pediatrician, my background pediatrician, and uh, my research and uh, interest is in uh, TP. And <clears throat> I think for me, this is uh, new for me to know that uh, we have the HIV self testing using the oral fluid. Yeah. But uh, from the scientific point of view or the, the methodological point of view, I'm quite uh, confusing about the, because I only have the, the abstract here. Uh, I did not see the, the aim of the, your project, whether you want to uh, assess the yield of positivity rate of uh, HIV infection among the high risk population using tested using the oral HIV self testing, or you want to assess about the feasibility or the acceptance, for example. So if you can make it more clear, so I think it will be more uh, strong in the scientific uh, basic. So maybe you can uh, respond to my concern. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Burina, for the uh, input. Uh, well, this is basically just the report of the uh, project delivered uh, back in 2021. Uh, the goal of the project is actually to uh, to bridge the gap uh, and helping the access of certain uh, very hidden communities, uh, just as an additional as just an additional uh, means of HIV testing for for certain uh, very discreet and hidden communities who. Who fail, who fail to attend the facility-based testing. So, uh, so it's more, more it's rather than the, a, a research. It's, it's, it's not a research project, but rather than a, a report to the project itself. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it looks like the like the report of a report of a project. Yeah. So we we conducting some pro, uh, a project and then we reported how is the result. But I yeah. think it is a very good uh, data. Yeah. I mean. I don't know in the field of it's IV, but if it is still uh, not common for people for publish about the oral fluid, it's IV self testing. So you can make it as a, a research, but using a secondary data. So we already have the project, and then we we make a, like a protocol or proposal to use that data to be analyzed, and then uh, give it as maybe just uh, want to know about the the yield. Uh, yeah. because that's the data that we have and the next uh, project that we can continue for this uh, uh, activity is to explore more about the acceptance of them uh, of using this test whether they're happy with it or it's helpful or maybe or harmful for them so it will be very uh, helpful for the uh, apa namanya, in the field of HIV yeah, in Indonesia. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Agree, Burina. Yeah. Thank you very much for the, the yeah. input, Burina. Yeah. But Krista? Yeah, maybe I would just comment? like uh, yeah, continue from uh, uh, Burina because maybe you also know the Yayasan Kerti Peraja in Denpasar because yeah, we have done like the OFT, yeah, the oral fluid test for the to improve the HIV testing um, among the men who have sex with men in uh, for the Hati study, maybe Hati you have project. heard, yeah, and then yeah. it is also has been published about uh, how the OFT can like uh, yeah improve the testing, but not like because you see also like 
after the testing they have to do the confirmatory test in the clinic but yeah like yeah maybe you can also uh, see in that uh, in the study it has been published so maybe you can see and it it will be interesting because i thought when i see uh, when i read the abstract it is also it is good because like it is like a, a continuity of the uh, previous study has been uh, conducted by yayasan kertip right yeah. i think that's the information for me thank you thank you so yes. much for thank you for the for the but yes. this is a suggestion also i think i believe of uh, an offer for collaborations to follow up the uh, if you would like exploring how to publish it better <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> yeah you, you have the data and bakrista and burina also has the expertise for the publication well um I have, of course, questions, but I think I would like to explore the questions not in this room. <laughs> Mas Henry is very interesting, yeah. but I, uh, because we are, uh, I need to be uh, strict on time. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Mas Henry Lewis, for the project. And mm -hmm. yeah, and then uh, we wrap the sessions for Mas Henry, and we continue to, we are actually quite good in time. And the final uh, presentation today, the last but not the least, into uh, Umi Latifa, you're here. Uh, the title is Intestinal Worm Infections Among HIV Patients in uh, Dr. Sarjito of Central Hospital, Yogyakarta. Ibu Umi, your seven minutes starts now. Yeah, I think. Can you speak a little bit louder? I um, I don't know. It's me only, or or the microphone that you use. Can hear the voice, yeah. Uh, Bumi, sorry, your your voice is not clear. I mean. Your sorry, can you hear my yes. voice? Yes, good now. No, it's good now. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. All right, uh, I'm Umar Atifah as an author from this journal, and I will present my journal with the title Intestinal Worm Infection Among HIV Patients in Dr. Sarjito Central Hospital, Yogyakarta. And this is the abstract from this journal. Human immunodeficiency virus at HIV infection is a disease that causes a decrease in the human immune system. HIV cases decrease in immune system, the patient will be more susceptible to other diseases such as uh, gastrointestinal infections, especially cause bacteria and parasites. And one of the clinical manifestations from this infection is diarrhea. Diarrhea was caused by intestinal parasite, and the intestinal parasites are protozoa and worms. And the worms such as Trichuris trichura, Ascaris lumbricoides, Strongyloides tercoralis, Necator americanus, and Ankylostoma duodenal. The study used a descriptive analytic observational method with a cross-sectional design and the location in Parasitology Laboratory, FKKMK UGM. The sample from this research were faces from HIV patient in Dr. Sarjito Hospital. Inclusion criteria were faces from patient aged 18 years and were collected by the researcher. And the exclusion 
Our faces were not sufficient for examination. The stool examination used Katokats and Haradamori. The data were described and analyzed using SPSS with Chesker test. The result from this research using 75 stool sample from HIV patient. And this is the types of intestinal parasites in HIV patient in Sarjito Hospital from July 2017 until January 2018. And the worms such as Ascaris lumbricoides, Trichuris ticura, hookworm, and Hemolepis nana. Social demographic characteristic of subject with HIV, there are gender, age, study, profession, clinical manifestation, therapy, clinical stage, CD40 cell, body mass index, and also intestinal worm infection. And this is the table about bivariate analysis. Uh, from the data, there were not be a significant difference in the chest score test or Fisher test. There are several factors from HIV patient in Dr. Sarjito Hospital, so it needs to be investigated to reduce the occurrence of infection and transmission. And the several group of this factor uh, include gen gender. HIV sufferers are dominated by men. And the result of the bivariate analysis, uh, this is this was not statistically significant, which meant that was no effect between intestinal worm infection and gender. Uh, but clinically, male and gender, transgender uh, have a higher risk than a females because the sexual behavior to anal. The risk factor from for the age of HIV, the risk reset using 18 years because in adults, immune system was well formed because the primary and secondary lymphoid organ had been fully formed and in the presence of previous infection, antibody had been formed from the infection. The result of the study of intestinal parasitic infection in HIV patient at Sarjito Hospital from July 2017 until 20 until January 2018 showed that all of risk factors such as CD40 cell count, clinical stage level, history therapy, clinical symptom, body mass index, age, gender, and demographic factor did not have a significant influence. So it is necessary to reassess find all factors that lead to intestinal worm infection in HIV patients to reduce and prevent fatal consequences due to intestinal worm infection. Summary and recommendation. Based on the study, it can be concluded that the prevalence of intestinal worm in HIV patients was 7 or 9.3% of the 75 samples. Uh, and the recommendation. Another research with other risk factors such as independent or uh, diet, uh, patient hygiene level, and environment that might impact the spread of intestinal parasite infection among HIV patients should be reviewed. Uh, this is a review from my journal. I think that's all. I will return to the moderator. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Thank you, Ibu Umi. Um, yeah. Um, then I would like to invite Ibu uh, Bakrista first, if you have comments or questions. No, no. Uh, no. Oh, Thank you. Okay. Then Ibu Rina. Thank you, Bakrista. Thank you, Pak Ari. Bu Umi, uh, congratulations yeah, for the, the research that you have done. Uh, is there any, was there any previous study, the similar study that conducted in Yogyakarta? Uh, sorry, 
Ibu, suaranya terputus. Oke, okay. was there any similar study that conducted previously in in Yogyakarta or in uh, at least in Yogyakarta ya yeah, or in uh, in Indonesia? Uh, in Yogyakarta uh, have a any research by Resalmana but only protozoa not worms. Uh, okay, so for from the worm infestation, this is the first study that we do for uh, its IV patients, yeah. Yes. Okay, and uh, compared to the other, the finding from the other studies in abroad, for example, so how is the, the prevalence here in, in Sarsita Hospital? So our you, you, how, how many is the how much is the prevalence? How is the prevalence of intestinal worm in its IV patients from your study? Nine point three percent. Okay, and what about in other studies? Mm. Other studies from other countries? Uh, Twenty until fifty percent. Okay, so. It is lower than in Indonesia, yeah. Yes, uh, actually, yeah. I uh, I use protozoa too, but the protozoa already published in other journal. Hmm. But only for the worm infestation, the worm is it twenty percent until fifty percent in other countries? Yes, in other countries. Okay. Yeah, so our finding is only six point uh, nine point three, yeah, nine point three percent. So where, where it is lower compared to the other countries? Uh, maybe because the hygiene level in other country uh, is is good, and uh, the people with with HIV in Indonesia. Uh, always uh, use how to another activities so the uh, worm cannot infect the HIV patient. Okay, then. and uh, considering for the result, uh, is there uh, any recommendation? for having, for example, anti uh, to taking anti warm medication as a prevention. Yeah, uh, I think uh, under research uh, will use a diet or the patient hygiene level or in, in the environment to have an impact. The spread intestinal worm. Uh, yeah. Okay, then. Thank you, Pak Ari. Thank you. Thank you, Ibu Rina. Yeah. Um, Bu Umi, um, um, I have questions, but I'm not sure it, uh, it's correct. But can you please go back to the slide that uh, indicates about certain groups are more vulnerable because of the anal sex behavior? I don't know which one is it. Is it the result or? Yeah. So in, in this sentence, uh, you says that um, males and transgender women have higher risk for getting infected with international parasites because of the sexual behavior. Does it appear also in your data analysis? In your case? Uh, yes. In it, uh, from the questionnaire. Yeah, I mean, but the analysis, does the analysis say so? I mean, is it the, the result of your analysis or this is theoretically? Uh, my theoretically. But it's, it's not proven in your analysis, right? The analysis is not significant. Okay. So there is no uh, gender difference, yeah? In terms of yes. international inspection. Okay. 
I just want to be here. All right, I think I don't have, I think this is a very interesting question, but um, um, in, uh, interesting um, analysis. And I also wonder what with the, uh, Bu, uh, the same uh, questions with the uh, Burina about the practical implications, whether or not, for example, you would like to rec recommend um, people living with HIV to consume uh, certain uh, preventive uh, uh, medication relating to the internal intestinal worm infections, something like that. So uh, uh, beyond the, the eating behavior uh, pattern and, uh, and everything. But uh, unfortunately, of course, we have to be uh, fair with other participants in terms of time allocations. Although, yeah, I think uh, uh, I need to check back again to uh, with Mbak Krista. Uh, still, uh, any comment or? No. Yeah. Okay. No, thank you. Then thank you very much. Then uh, your session is wrapped up. Uh, Ibu Umi Latifah, thank you again for the presentation the discussions yeah and with that i think uh bapa and ibu ladies and gentlemen that we uh we are, we have arrived at the end of our um, um oral presentation sessions again i would like to express my gra gratitude to all the presenters for their uh very interesting project and also uh, uh analysis uh in these sessions, really appreciate your time and uh, happy to uh, have opportunity to uh, be uh, part of the presentation process, learning from the all the the uh, the various topic here. So I think uh, I, with that, I would like to close these sessions and thank you for Ibu Rina and also Mbak Krista Dewi for. Um, um, for uh, uh, giving feedback and comment, also I think at the end to assess the the to evaluate the the presentations with the scoring and everything. So uh, yeah, thank you, and I would like to give this back to the organizer uh, because our session is already end. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.